Welcome to the IntiHub's uh, 10x web webinar. Uh, we're going to have dialogues here on the future, emerging technologies, innovation, exponential transformation, as well as future-proof uh, leadership. My name is Nofel Chayadi. I'm the CEO and founder of IntiHub based in Dubai, and I will be your webinar host today. So a little bit uh, about NTHub. We are an award-winning innovation and exponential transformation consulting firm. What we do is basically partnering with our clients to help them navigate through innovation that can potentially drive their exponential business growth. So if you would like to kickstart innovation within your organization or use innovation to drive your business growth, then you can simply talk to us. So you can please check out our, our website for our programs and uh, services. Let me start by sharing with you the sustainable development goals. As probably some of you would know, SDGs are the collection of 17 global goals that are designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future of, uh, for all of us. The SDGs were set back in 2015 by the United Nations uh, General Assembly, and they are intended to be achieved by the year 2030. So we only have 10 years to achieve all of this. Now, the challenge is that 17 goals, that's actually pretty a lot, right? And in order to meet these SDGs, the 17 goals, we will require some fund, right, some funding to fund the initiatives and programs so that we can meet these SDGs. And in fact, two and a half trillion US dollars in private and public financing per year, as of 2017, as some estimates, are actually required to finance the initiatives. In addition to that, 13 and a half trillion US dollars are also required to implement some initiatives uh, for the Climate Accord, according to 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference. Uh, that's a lot of money, actually, two and a half and 13 and a half uh, trillion, trillion US dollars. Now, the big question mark is, how do we close the funding gap in order to meet the SDGs? So, in 2015, the concept of blended finance was actually born. And it was introduced at the third international conference on financing for development. Uh, the blended finance back then was recognized as a solution that can contribute to raise the private financing uh, that are required to close the funding gap. So now 70% of us say that we have zero or little knowledge about blended finance. So please don't sweat it. <laughs> including me. That's so, why I'm here. So, <laughs> right? so, exactly. As I do, she's going to talk about the blended finance. I can assure you, by the end of this webinar, you'll be blown away by the knowledge that, that you have on the uh, blended finance. The concept of blended finance has gained popularity recently within the world of international development finance. And as a result, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has adopted some principles. They have adopted blended finance principles in order to guide the design and implementation of the concept, So, which is actually good. So if you want to know more about the principles, you just simply go to the OECD website. Now, as the blended finance has gained increased attention in the in recent years, in fact, it is an approach that has been leveraged for quite some time. So how do we prove it? It has been reflected in the number of transactions and the total dual volume to date. The good news is the blended finance market is quite substantial and it's growing and it's comparable to other important markets. So to give you some perspective, according to Global Impact Investing Network, the impact investing assets under management in 2018 were around 230 billion US dollars. While according to OECD, the Official Development Assistance or ODA to developing countries in 2017 
was around 145 billion US dollars. So what does that mean to us? That means there is a lot of potential under blended finance. And then here we are, we're going to talk about the potential of blended finance solutions. And in more specific, we will ask ourselves, how can we finance social innovation at scale to transform business models while having a sizable impact on society and environment? So that includes you and your organizations, of course. And the second questions that we should ask ourselves, for those who are in the Islamic finance, we're going to, to actually delve into the opportunity for the Islamic finance around this blended uh, finance to support the corporate transformations around impact. It's an honor for me today to introduce to you to my dear friend, my mentor, and my ex-professor uh, in IE Business School. So Professor Fanina Farber. Fanina is an economist and political scientist specializing on social innovation, entrepreneurship, and corporate social responsibility. With almost 20 years of teaching, researching, and consultancy experience, uh, she's been working with you know, academic inst institutions, multinational corporations, and even international organizations. So currently, she's holding the role as the, the director of the Area Center for Social Innovation and the professor of social innovation at the IMD Business School in Lausanne, Switzerland. Previously, before IMD, Fanina was the dean of the Graduate School of Business at the Universidad del Pacifico mm -hmm. uh, in Peru. And prior to that, she was an adjunct professor for the IE Business School in Madrid, Spain, where she taught economic environment and country analysis. And that's where I met Fanina as my professor. And she was actually one of my favorite professors back then. <laughs> 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 I'm not very no, but but because we are in front of the other people here, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, Fanina holds a PhD in business administration in economics from the University of Memphis in the USA. So Fanina, welcome and thank you so very much for accepting my invitation to share your stories in our TEDx webinar. Thank you, Noel, for your absolutely kind uh, presentation. Should I say he was, Noel was one of my favorite students, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> exchanging compliments, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, no, but Today, the idea, since you don't have a lot of uh, background and it's not required to have a background on blended finance, uh, we will, I tried to make a journey so you understand what is this world of sustainable finance. And you're going to hear a lot of different terms that are turned around like ESG, and we're going to talk what that means or impact investing, and then blended finance. And how can blended finance, and Nobel already explained to you uh, or gave you a, a, a brief definition of what it is, uh, can also be a solution for corporate transformation. And uh, really what, uh, in many cases, we have seen blended finance tools, but more for development uh, kind of solutions. So can corporations that want to transform around sustainability also use blended finance? And uh, so the agenda for today, I will go quickly on what are we in the world these days, and we'll try to tell you about what is the map of the sustainable finance spectrum so you understand what we're talking about. I will share with you some examples that I'm researching and collaborating of blended finance solutions and then have a little bit of a discussion and hopefully get some of your questions on why I think that Islamic finance is a perfect framework to actually align with ESG, environmental, social and governance criteria and the SDGs, the sustainable <coughs> development goals that Novel mentioned and actually how with collaborative blended finance solutions, we can diversify economies and have more inclusive business models. So this is a, a, a little bit uh, the, the kind of journey uh, we are going to have uh, today uh, together. All right, so uh, that looks very good uh, on the agenda, Fanina. Now, before we delve into those agenda, I'm always curious because uh, I know you as an economy, economist, mm -hmm. right? Now, I would like to understand from you what motivated you to work on social innovation 
and blended finance. And perhaps you can also tell us a bit about what is happening in the financial sector these days, especially with the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic and stuff. So I, I my, my PhD dissertation was an international macroeconomics and exchange rate crisis. No, uh, so I come from Argentina, so I'm a, the whole country is kind of specialist on that. But I, I always was interested on development and impact. And I think it, precisely at the time when we were together at IE Business School in uh, 2007, or during the global financial crisis, uh, I started researching and I realized that a lot of financial institutions that were using Islamic finance principles were actually performing better. You no, know? and I started to realize, and we were seeing that how some of the principles of tying that money not having a value per se, but tying it to a real economy, uh, actually could ground and be the sources of. Uh, outperforming other companies and at the same time I was starting to look into this was so again more than 10 years ago into corporate social responsibility and those companies that were trying to make a profit but at the same time have a positive impact on society and the environment so really this led me in a, in a long road until these days but I think that the common thread all the time was of thinking about how can you mobilize private capital to really innovate business models. No. Um, so, and I think now the, the, the COVID crisis is something of the silver lining, if we could find one to, to what is happening, is that many corporations, many businesses had to transform very fast, you know, with demands halting completely and with huge demands from society they had to transform you have seen luxury brands doing masks or perfumes doing gel and alcohol uh, car makers working on respirators and, mm -hmm. and and even collaboration in an interest in the pharmaceutical industry so how they were able to transform very quickly cooperate in order to answer social and hopefully in the future to environmental problems you know so I think this idea of cooperation, this mindset can be part of how we, as you're mentioning, Switzerland is also reopening here and they, today they announced there will be a very large reopening mid-June or actually beginnings of June. Uh, so how can we uh, not go back to normal, normal? No, so let's go back to reopen the economy, but how can we have business models that actually been within live within the uh, mon the planetary boundaries and have a positive impact on society you know so we have seen also through this crisis how uh, unequal different populations have been affected and if you look at the case of singapore if you look in latin america uh, we are seeing uh, how damaging this can be and we are also seeing from the corporate side again a massive destruction of value. So I think the, this crisis, the, the, something that I think was Paul Romer that said that we shouldn't let a crisis go to waste, a good crisis go to waste. So I think this is precisely the moment uh, where we can accelerate change. But to accelerate change, we will need funding, as you mentioned. No? Uh, and so if there is something that I wanted to get from, from this webinar is what it means uh, to invest for impact at a corporate level, at an individual level, etc., and how blended finance can actually be part uh, of the solution. No? So, uh, I know now will ask you to to write the Q and A on to write the questions on on the Q and A, please. So do that. But I will ask you a very simple question: What do you see in this picture? And this you can write it on the chat. What do you see? I just want to see if you're awake and you're still there. I used to do that in class too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you Very do? smart. Right? <laughs> I know. Do you see the picture there? Yeah, there's a picture. Yeah, I see that. Not the IMD logo. No, no, no. What do you see in the picture? You see space between the trees, but if you see space between the trees, you see trees too. Good. <laughs> okay. 
So you see space between the trees and trees. What else? Who else? Anybody see something else? Dried leaves. Great. Any specific about those trees? Anybody has like an eye for detail and can tell me what kind of trees? Competing uses of land. Okay, Licia is already more looking into the business perspective. Great, you are correct. There is a use of land. This is actually a plantation. Glue trees, rubber trees. Excellent. Uh, Alali leaf. Sorry if I mispronounced the name. So you are correct. You see a plantation of rubber trees. Um, it is a forest production. And the good thing is this is actually sustainable, but you, you don't really know. No. Uh, so, if you are a corporate and if you are, for example, a tire producer like Michelin, this could be a value chain a sourcing problem. Are you having, because we know that using rubber is causing, in many cases, deforestation, so there is a huge pressure from society to try to see where the rubber is coming from. So, this could be actually a sustainability issue that a large corporation has a challenge and actually needs to transform, needs to certify, and needs to show that they're proactively changing the type of mo or, or how they were doing. And for example, knowing the sources where things come from, it's not only for rubber, but it, it, became, it is very important for diamonds, it's important for chocolate, it's important for tobacco, for any kind of commodity, uh, even for cell, cell phones or batteries of, of electric cars. You know? But also you can look at the other side and you can actually see um, a, a solution rather than the challenge. This is a sustainable plant-based solution to uh, rubber production. You see farming in a sustainable way uh, as a solution. At the same time, you can think who's behind of this uh, plantation and you know, and, it, and this is actually a plantation in, in Indonesia, many smallholder farmers, their whole livelihood depends on this kind of small land plantations and also agricultural products that they can grow uh, on the sides. But you can get even more complex, and this is what we are going to talk today. You can see actually a $95 million collaborative blended finance a facility that is finances sustainable rubber with a multi-stakeholder collaboration that unites a corporate Michelin with Barito, a local uh, plantation, the United Nations Environmental Program, the WWF, a U.S. Cooperation Agency, ADM Capital and BNP Paribas that are a bank and a commercial, a large commercial bank. So again, I'm going to go on this in detail, but I'm just trying to overwhelm you so you realize that these kind of blended finance solutions can involve a lot of actors and can become a very interesting solution because the different players will play a different role and a different incentive and will actually uh, help these uh, solutions become a reality when before they were almost impossible to, to pull off, you know. So I think we are at a time with this kind of solutions already, and this is the challenge of blended finance, to see your problems or any goods or services that you see around and transform them in social innovations. So a lot of uh, stakeholders are involved in the blended finance. I think that's quite a challenging factor, right? Now, uh, Ranina, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, there's so many terms floating around these days, like the ESG, which is the environment, so social and governance. And then some people are talking about impact investing. And earlier we talked about SDGs and then green bonds, impact investment. And here we are talking about blended finance. Uh, perhaps you can probably explain to us a little bit on these different vehicles on the spectrum of opportunities to mobilize the private capital for impact. And also, I'm wondering, uh, how is it different from the sustainable investing? Can you explain okay. a bit? Yes. So I, I will go a little bit and just, uh, in the basis is, we're going to say there are many different strategies to mobilize sustainable investment, no, many different strategies to mobilize private capital that include 
uh, environmental, social, and governance criteria. So whenever we talk about ESG, uh, we talk about environmental, social, and governance. Mm -hmm. And I put a lot of logos below this because many of these companies had actually uh, scandals and problems with some of the criteria. We all know Volkswagen uh, with emissions, um, labor supply chain problems with GAP, H&M, and, and governance issues. Uh, Parmalat, Equifax, Wells Fargo, Santander, Facebook, Oxel on data privacy, etc. So this could cause a lot of damage. So a lot of investors are first started this thinking about these issues because of a risk perspective, saying, okay, we, if we don't take if we don't take into account this non-financial, they were non-financial, but they actually do have a financial um, effect when we have these kinds of problems. And but uh, in reality, and again, I will not go on all of this. This is a paper by Bob Eccles, a colleague uh, that you can look at Harvard Business Review, and I have the link there. But really, it's a set of strategies that you can use to canalize private capital in different ways. And I think the initial stages was negative was exclusionary screening. And this actually came from the upper, upper state in South Africa. You know, when a lot of companies were called not to put money in South Africa to uh, until apartheid was uh, terminated. You know? So let's not give money to those that are not behaving correctly. Let's not finance, finance things that are harmful. And I think if you think about uh, Islamic finance again, you have this idea of not, of not doing no harm. You know? So this idea of ex excluding certain sectors it can be very intuitive. intuitive. The same happens with norm base, and you can exclude not only some harmful, what you consider harmful industries, but some that do not uh, respect different type of principles like the UN uh, Global Compact Principle. Other strategies are, okay, not only let's exclude the bad ones, but let's put money on the good ones. So let's go and invest in the best in class, in the Patagonias, in the Unilevers, in the Danone, in uh, Nesty, if you want, in the, in the oil and gas sector. So how can we be proactive and actually give an incentive and finance those so as long as they get these additional funds, they will invest more and they will actually also become even more profitable. Other type of investing is really sustainability theme investment. So, okay, I care about water, or I care about uh, gender issues and inclusion, or I care about labor practices, or I care about biodiversity. So you do kind of funds or bonds, and there are different kind of tools. You can use clean water, renewable energy to do theme investing. And others, is, let's include across all asset classes in all the portfolio, ESG integration. And I actually working with a couple of, of large asset managers now in Europe and talking to one in, in two in Asia. So half of the people that are dealing now with programs are uh, large institutions that are looking at how to integrate these criteria given who they are. You know? And I think the very interesting part, there is also this active ownership. You know, there is less uh, engage with companies and try to or, or show them what kind of things we think are problematic, but let's engage with them so we can change it. And the last part is impact investing. There is a field that I'm working a lot and, and that I actually enjoy. That is, it's, related, it's not companies that are, that, that are public or in the stock market. It's how can we have a private capital invested in, in entrepreneurs or in social innovations or in certain sec sectors that build businesses really around social and environmental solutions. So just to make a, a, a quick graph, I'm an economist, you know, I, I like graphs. So if you have the financial returns, so you go from below market returns to financial or above market returns and market returns to the impact side on the X axis, you have the traditional philanthropy where you have lots of impact, but below market return, negative return. And then you have the traditional investment where you have market returns, but we don't care necessarily what kind of impact it has. It's a portfolio that is diversified. I just care about the results there. In between, you have a whole amount of things. And here is where you have sustainable investment and responsible investment. So the responsible investment are uh, usually in the definition is that part of the exclusionary. We're going to mitigate risk and exclude certain bad ESG risks. 
when you get to sustainable investment is how can I include proactively uh, ESG practice of, of so I can identify opportunities and outperform and return. But all of these marry with these two, if you want, returns with impact. And there's a whole other sector that is more what we call the impact investing side, because this side is more the socially responsible, the sustainable investing, where you have really the idea of thematic investing, of impact first, in investing and venture philanthropy. Venture philanthropy will become quite important, I will mention in a minute, that actually have a different type of risk profile and work in different stages, I would say, of a of the life cycle of a company of an entrepreneur and, and they finance different things. So when you get thematic investment, you're still at the market return. But when you talk about venture philanthropy, philanthropists are using now a lot of foundations and your family offices are actually transforming and saying, we're not going to do the traditional philanthropy, the charity or the grants that we were doing in the past. We want to do loans and equity and different kinds of things to companies. But we are going to work maybe in the, in the value of debt before the companies are making revenue, but at the moment when they have proof of concept and, and start to scale up. And at that time, it's when a lot of entrepreneurs die. So at that point, this money that does not necessarily look for and can accept some below market returns is very useful. So this whole arena, and I think having this map a little bit helps because blended finance will include different of these players in different types of roles. You know? So you have the market adjusted or the market rate with risk adjusted returns. You have the mitigation of risk risk. And really, and the last part, you have these ESG opportunities. And many times you're going to hear about this as the impact economy. You know? So really, there's a lot of words, responsible, sustainable, thematic, ESG, opportunity, impact economy. But what at the end, what we're all talking about is how can we intentionally, so we have this purpose behind position private capital so that we get financial returns but also a desired outcome on the social and environmental side. So, so how can we get win-win solutions that we don't have to sacrifice and have a trade-off? And it's not easy. No, and in the impact investing sometimes is even harder uh, than others. So the key issues about what impact investing is, as I mentioned a minute ago, one is intentionality. So I do because every investment actually has a purpose, you know, or, or has an impact. But these are people that are actually investing on this to create a desired outcome. So I want to invest in clean water to uh, make it to the last mile of smallholder farmers in Africa. Uh, and I want to bring filters or type of solutions or solar lamps, etc. So I want to do something. And in order to make sure that I do something, I need to measure my impact. So it's not just about goodwill, but I need to have KPIs. I need to have a theory of change of what I want to go, and I need to have targets of how to get it. And at the end, I think an interesting concept, and it's not for all the impact investors, so this does not make the definition, but many impact investors do, is that they want to be in places that is called additionality. So if the impact investment money was not there, commercial money would not touch it because it would have been perceived as too risky. No, so this idea of additionality is actually quite important for blended finance because blended finance goes precisely to this higher than normal risk kind of projects where you somehow de-risk them by the collaboration. And obviously, since it is investment, and in order to be called an investment, you need to have the expectations of financial return. You know? So you do have a, a return coming to these things. So this is kind of from the from the, the definition side. And I will show you two quick examples. One is Hermes, is one, uh, one company that are actually on the, uh, what I was mentioning on the sustainable finance side, does a lot of engagement with companies. So they do give they work with companies that they identify the key problems and issues, and then they engage with them and they give times for to resolving those conflicts. And here, for example, the, 
you can see like the different lights. It's a little, or, or I cannot even see very well with glasses, but it's about Shell company and there were some problems with uh, performance base and with uh, internal mandate, et cetera. And I think there is a, an explanation on the side on how they are engaged. And it doesn't matter exactly the issues, you can look at it, Hermes and go into their, their homepage and see a lot of examples. But the idea is they look at ESG criteria, they engage with their board, they engage with the CFO, with the executive, depending on the type of problems. And they actually work in order to give uh, investment to them, so to include them in the portfolio, they, uh, they need to have these problems resolved. Uh, I had in a webinar that I'm doing at IMD every Wednesday, a person from, uh, from a Triodos bank, and he mentioned, for example, they excluded Tesla from the portfolio. Tesla is a company that does, you know, electric cars. You think that's great for the environment, but they found a lot of G in the G in the governance issues. They were not transparent. They were not saying where the cobalt from the batteries was coming from on the sourcing, and they had so they decided not to include it. So they actually look at this criteria and how they invest. Then you have the other side, the impact investor. You know, and this is the Lea Foundation. It's actually the donor of the chair, it's the founder of the the family of the founder of the chair of this foundation, and they invest in social entrepreneurs in emerging economies, and they use philanthropic or venture philanthropy uh, to finance uh, entrepreneurs that deal with absolute poverty in emerging markets. And here you see one of the solutions, they work with solar lamps and pay as you go systems and in Africa. No. So between these two worlds, there is really a lot more money on the side of the shell and on the public markets than in the private markets for entrepreneurs. No. So how can how can we put together the story here and how do you look at this as different types of, of a spectrum, but that can be combined? So do they, we can uh, reconcile this uh, ESG with the impact investment. Can we actually finance like uh, innovative solutions at scale and transform organizations around impact? So, and I think that's why I like um, Blender Finance, you know, yeah. because it can use a little bit of all of these pieces uh, of the information. And, and let me define a little bit um, and try to go quickly on this. But Blender Finance, in summary, Blender Finance, you know, blended the word means mixed. So it's a mix of different sources of, of, of capital. So you use catalytic capital from public or philanthropic sources, plus then that serves as an attractor or a, or a pool of money that de-risk a project that attracts private commercial capital at scale. So really, uh, it's a mix of private, public, and philanthropic money to find promising solutions really to accelerate uh, the development goals that we were talking or any kind of social or environmental problem. So really, the idea is that the public money that can come from, a, from the government or from a developmental agent, a DFI, Development Financial Institution, or even from a philanthropic, from a foundation, etc., works in a way that is a backup. So private investors that before look at projects and they thought, okay, no, this is too risky, actually are more willing to engage and to invest because these institutions will take the first loss and we, we will mention in a, in a bit. And let me give you an example that I actually love. And again, if you want to know more, there is also a webinar I will share in the PowerPoint, the link where when a person from Ben Pepper explains very well how this works. But this is the, the rubber trees that you just saw in, in, my, in my initial a part of the PowerPoint. And I will try to go a little fast because where time is very, uh, it's, it's flying. So they actually created a fund, a 95, uh, it's not a fund, it's a bond, the sustainability bond of $95 million bond uh, and to fund or to finance reforestation of natural rubber in, in Sumatra and in Iskaliwantan in Indonesia. You know? And they have very clear environmental goals 
and they gave this money to a joint venture. So they actually, uh, that was constituted between Michelin, that is the, the corporate that produces tires and needed the sustainable rubber that has 45%, and a local affiliate, Barito Pacific, that works on the, on, precisely on the sustainable rubber uh, plantation. So they are the ones receiving and managing this, um, this, uh, this money, if you want, this capital. This is 88,000 88, hectares, and there are really 45,000 of those go for the livelihoods and conservation of the community. They created 16,000 jobs and 18,000 hectares of rubber that went directly to as I was mentioned, to, to Michelin, that is the off-taker and actually buying this. And I think the interesting thing is that ADM is created a platform and gives the loans and long-term debt. Then you have Ben Paribas that securitized all these loans and created three tranches. You now 30 million, the first one, one at 15 year, one five year and one seven years with different uh, return to sell in the private market. And this is how they actually brought private capital. But why, why would private commercial money go into this that sounds very risky in a, a, a sustainable uh, land in Indonesia? First, one the risky in part is, okay, Michelin is gonna buy, buy all this rubber. So you have the value change of the corporate. And for the corporate, you solve the problem for them of sustainable value chain. But at the same time, they got a DFI, a development finance institution. They got, in this case, the USAID, the, the cooperation agency of the, the United States, to back up 50% of this bond. So they take the first loss of 50% of this money. So if the, this doesn't work, they will pay the money to the investors and will take the first loss. So how many of your investments these days are backed up 50% of the money you put? Not mine, <laughs> not my pension, I don't know yours, uh, but I have not been that lucky. After they got that, they actually moved and gave them an A uh, ranking. And they have uh, also external partners, the United Nations Environmental Program that has been very, and they have actually a fi financial initiative uh, section, very active on blended finance solutions, that is, and also agroforestry monitoring the environmental solutions. And they have WWS to make sure that the environmental standards are respected. And the Indonesian government is also supporting, not necessarily financially, but it's also a lot of land proprietary and contracts, etc. So you see how the different players play different roles in order to transform a problem, a problem deforestation, problems with rubber, and to have sustainable rubber plantation that could have been quite problematic with a lot of smallholder uh, plantations that are difficult to pull together into an one uh, solution. You know, so I, I do find this, this uh, example extremely inspiring. You know? uh, I, I do have another example, but I'm probably not going to have time to show it. And if we, I, because I would love to get to the questions, but um, we, if they have, I can, you can share Novel the presentation later. There is also another solution when the whole industry of cocoa and you have companies like Mars, like Nestle, like uh, Mondelez, et cetera, pulled together with the foundation, the Jacob Foundation and the UBS Foundation with philanthropic money to deal with child labor and quality of education in, in Africa. No? So uh, th there is other examples that you can see. But what I find interesting here is that it's not only for development issues, it's not only the public sector development agencies and the financial sector, but this includes also corporates. Corporates that have a material sustainability issue that is a risk, that is a problem, that is something they want to transform that they're leveraging on the power of blended finance and become an uptakers because they buy, they also do with the project, but they become part of the solution. So I think this can be, we tend to look at blended finance from the development perspective, 
but again, I work at a business school <laughs> and I w research a lot on corporate transformation. I feel that it's a very promising field also to support companies in their transformation. Anina, uh, you earlier mentioned that uh, blended finance could potentially generate great opportunities for Islamic finance institutions. Uh, I don't know how many people in this uh, webinar are actually uh, working for the Islamic finance institutions. I think they would like to hear uh, about that. So I, I will be brief and again, and if we have the Q&A, some more specific questions we can talk, but I'm doing research with a colleague uh, in the UK and we're just starting, but I, I did work in the past and, and, I, and I'm working now with two banks in, in Asia that are trying to precisely integrate uh, ESG, as we said, environmental, social, and governance criteria that they do in their investment decisions with Islamic finance. You're gonna see many banks, if you want, that they have their Islamic finance on one side and then they have the asset managers on the other side and then they have the sustainability or the CSR department in another side and, and if they do impact investment, even in another side. So really siloed type of solutions. Now, so what I'm working now is in trying to integrate from a strategy perfect perspective and how can that drive new products, you no know, innovation. And, and why I think it's, it's special, I think because uh, precisely Sharia, Sharia Law wants to uh, talk about more ethical financial markets that create a positive non-financial value alongside with financial returns. And that's all what sustainable finance is too. You know? and, and I think some of the core principles of, of Islamic finance, like channeling funding to the real economy or risk sharing, you just heard the idea of risk sharing, avoiding ex excessive speculation, limiting debt uh, in the value of assets, and, and thinking of money not as a money per se, as having an inherent value, but really what impact and positive impact that can have. You no, know? so. How can that be good for the community and abstain from harm? This idea of halal, you know, um, and how the, of doing good. Uh, so, and I also think that as you see these uh, blended finance instruments or facilities have a, a strong place for sometimes philanthropic institutions or for developmental institutions or for government institutions. So I think it's a good place to collaborate with uh, financial institutions, uh, uh, Islamic financial institutions, but also with foundations. And I think the idea of, of Zakat uh, or the idea of Sadaqa uh, in, in Islamic finance can be a pool of money that if we think in a different way of how to invest, in, uh, invest it or how to use it, um, even uh, Wakaf, uh, that could also be highly aligned with the principles of, of blended finance and, and sustainable finance in general. So I really think that it's a, a, an interesting road to experience and, and there are some interesting things happening, but I don't think that it has gone further enough to really be kind of part of the foundation of the economic diversification that many countries are looking for in, in these times or, or right. need. You know? yeah. Yeah, and I can show you in the PowerPoint, but again, I will not mention because I prefer to go to questions, but there are some good examples you now. And there is a Sakata line with SDGs that has been done by, by Basna's Renewable, Renewable Energy Product. There is a humanitarian Sukuk, uh, then uh, one with uh, UNCI with refugees and, uh, and, and another organization. And there's an, a green Sukuk that I think was just one of the first one with a World Bank uh, supported by the World Bank and the Central Bank of Malaysia. No? But again, in all these cases, you still don't see the corporate side of the story, it's the more traditional, mm. uh, but still is, I think they're starting to grow. And I found that in Dubai this March, uh, UNDP has a great section on, on, on Islamic finance and on blended finance and Dubai Islamic Economic Development Center actually signed a memorandum of understanding with UNDP to collaborate and align a lot of the things that they're doing uh, with the sustainable development goals. And probably some blended final solutions will be part of it. Okay, this is just a memorandum of understanding, 
but I think it opens door or to have a proper framework of, of collaboration. Well, I would like to explore more on the those potentials on the MENA region, but we've got some questions here. Uh, right. So first from Dr. Christian Edi Nugroho. Uh, Christian. Right. Uh, Dr. Fanina, I would like to ask what are the indispensable considerations through lens of similarities and differences within ESG for corporate transformation, especially within the new normal and the next normal in case of Indonesia with its unique case? Okay, so for me the key when you're talking about corporate transformation and ESG is that corporates need to understand which sustainability issues are material. So look at the idea of materiality. No, and obviously materiality for a financial, for a financial institution or for a oil and gas or for a consumer goods is not the same. But as I tell you, if you're producing uh, tires, rubber sourcing is a key to you. If you are uh, in diamonds, uh, blood diamonds, and what you do with labor relationships, or if you are in garment, your labor practices is a material issue to you. And we've seen value chain, how COVID, how disrupted could have been. If you are in consumer goods, maybe packaging and plastic can be a problem. No? So the material issue is different. So what I would say is that should be kind of aligned because financial institutions will look at that. Corporates need to be very aware and drive the strategy around materiality of the issues and actually try to blend or to, to build collaborations around that. If you look at the example I mentioned briefly of the cocoa industry, child labor is material to all of them. They all have the problem and it's very difficult to work individually. So how can they all pull together when they have this value and this problem in the value chain? So again, what I would say ESG is there are so many criteria. If you need to prioritize, prioritize material issues. Right. And from those material issues, differentiate which ones are licensed to operate that everybody does. And you have to do it because house cleaning, I don't know, CO2 emissions or things that you need to do now. And which ones drive innovation and which ones differentiate you. And that's harder. So. Can, can we move on to the next uh, question from Licia Erza? How long did it take from concept to kick off the <laughs> initiative or the execution going live? given many stakeholders, as we uh, talked about earlier, what complexities arise in the process? Uh, they're extremely long, so you have to be patient. And especially the first one you do, uh, it is long. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the timing, but since I've met them, uh, probably took all two years, I know. But again, I, you should contact Pierre, so I can put you in contact. But I, I've been in touch with many of these, and they do take time. The good thing is the more you work with institutions that have an experience, WWF has experience now, uh, United Nations Environmental Program, UNDP, and as, as also governments and BFIs are having more experience, things are starting to speed up. Obviously, regulation does not help, and when you get a large commercial bank with the compliance offices, uh, it gets more complicated. But the good thing that many of the blended finance solutions, they can keep off balance sheet and that lights and up a lot the process. But it is a cumbersome process and you need to be looking uh, at, uh, have a long-term view and think of this as precisely you need this because uh, it's a pilot, then you roll it up and you can scale it up and you can replicate it. And the sooner you start, you will have first mover advantage and since this is a difficult thing to pull off, uh, I think being the first one makes sense. But it, but it, it takes coordination and yeah. execution, yeah. Thank you, Fanina. Uh, the next question from Ari Wasono. Is there any difference in the use of blended finance in the sector, uh, in the private sector uh, and public sector? How the impact on the economy, uh, how's the impact on the economy and the community? There shouldn't be, but it's true that in this sector, sadly, it's a fairly new, as Noval mentioned, 
uh, the idea of blended finance, and you've seen the OECD definition, I gave you the WEF definition, so it's using catalytic capital that can be public money or philanthropic to attract commercial money at scale. So it shouldn't be different definition in the private and public sector. But it's true that sometimes the interpretations can be different or the way that people use it in every day can be different. Um, I don't think that when we say blended finance, uh, we still think about corporate transformation. We think development goals, we think, but it's okay. But the problem is that we, in that mindset, still corporations are not players on these bigger developmental or systemic issues. So we need to start being, so they need to start being part of the, the solution because they have a role. They can be the uptaker, as you say, uptaker, uptaker of, the, of the products or services. They can de-risk part of the products. They can provide technology and productivity um, in these kinds of things. You can have, again, this pay for excellence or pay for, for performance. So really, uh, I think adding this corporate side uh, a little bit more into the story will be important. I don't think you will see that a lot, even in the, in the public institutions. And sometimes DFI, development of finance institutions, can be criticized to say, do you really want to put money something that benefits the mm. corporate? But, but the world is changing and we're realizing, again, an SDG 17 talks about multi-stakeholder collaboration. Yeah. So that's what we should be doing. I think uh, the next question is really interesting because we didn't uh, talk about how to measure the impact, right? So it is from Sufyan Kalsekar. Are there any tools or methods for understanding the magnitude of the impact of impact investment? How can we account for all outputs in this type of investment? More importantly, how do we accurately show this to investors? We okay. have more and more uh, better tools to do. There's no uh, completely standardized uh, methodology, but if you look at environmental issues, the EU just mm -hmm. had a taxonomy and it's talking about the Green Deal. So okay. it's not like 10 years ago where I, I actually made a living for a while when I, at the same time I was teaching that, I was working for the UN and I was doing impact, <laughs> impact measurement. No? So because I was good at econometrics, so I could use the econometric tools and, and, and in, impact indicators to things that were difficult to measure. We are not there anymore. And there are, there's a lot of good hints, even in the SDGs, when you go to the specific targets, you're gonna see some hints. And if you look at SASB, materiality, you're gonna see criteria and you can go to integrated reporting right now, uh, GRI, you're gonna have basic frameworks, okay? But also uh, you can, do more specific and if you look at the LA foundation they have their own uh, proprietary impact measurement and you're going to see in many cases a very specific API. If you collaborate for example with WWF or if you collaborate with the UNDP if you're doing social or, or if you collaborate with a Red Cross ICRC they have actually a humanitarian bond, uh, they have already very good KPIs to measure social environmental impact. So, right. By collaborating, you can build a tool, but you always need to think about the opportunity cost. You don't want it to be extremely costly, impossible to measure. So it has to be tailored, target, focused, but comparable. No? And it used to be a huge problem. Now it's just a problem. I wouldn't say it doesn't exist, but there, I think there is enough uh, good things around to, to have a strong performance measurement. So in case you, you can contact me on LinkedIn or here you have uh, information, sorry, there you are, with my email. Okay. Just a little bit of announcement here. So next week we have the 10X webinar on Wednesday, June the 3rd at 5 p.m. Dubai or 3 p.m. CET. We will have Mr. Budiman Sujatniko, the director of Innovator 4.0 ID, who's going to talk about the visionary realist who grounded futurist leadership in the post COVID 19 era. And as you can see, we are actually pretty booked up in the next eight weeks. Every week, we've got pretty diverse speakers from uh, different countries talking about the future, emerging technologies exponential organizations, the future leadership, and so on and so forth. So stay tuned. 
We will give more information about this by email and also you can check it out in our social media channels. Also, this is for free for those who are interested and for those who are in Middle East. Purpose Alliance and Inti Hub, we're going to organize this global purpose challenge. Concurrently organizing this in different countries and different cities. So we are organizing this for the people in the Middle East to address the challenge with the future of work. So here we're gonna, you're going to team up with people in the Middle East and you will be trained in the exponential organization methodologies and you will get some mentorship from the expert coaches and also networking with the global exponential organization communities. So mark your, uh, your calendar 26th of June. You will hear from us on how to register and so on. And also this one, we're going to launch the 10X Sprint online immersive and experiential journey for six weeks for you to become future-proof innovators, entrepreneurs, or entrepreneurs. This one, unfortunately, is not free. <laughs> we will launch it sometime in June. And again, you're gonna hear from us about this. Fanina, before you go, can you give us a few lines for your parting message for everyone, please? Yeah, I think, uh, especially post this COVID world, uh, the demands uh, from society, even from investors, you see from a more sustainable and inclusive business models and economic di diversification are only going to be louder. You know? So I really think that blended, collaborative blended finance solutions can work as a pathfinder you know, and bring public funding to unlock commercial financing and really support the transformation that we all need and speed up that transformation because we, we can and I, I like this idea of the 10X that, you, that you're talking because precisely we are learning how to finance innovation, but how to scale it up is even harder. But even if you see, and imagine if you think about systemic kinds of things and economic models, you know, so really building more inclusive economics models needs this kind of collaboration where we leverage on, on everybody's incentives and assets, you know, and and I think then the finance solutions also need to adapt to local environments to, to leverage on the context. And I think you do have in, uh, in Dubai and in some of the countries of Asia that, that, I, that we've seen mentioned in our participants, precisely a, a very fertile soil on Islamic finance, especially because it's especially suited to, to finding solutions that create non-financial value along uh, this idea of some financial return not excessive and not interest rates, obviously, no. But this idea of of, of growth behind it and tied to real economy. So, uh, obviously, and I, I think we had a very good question there. The the devil is on the execution and the challenges of these multi-stakeholder collaborations. But you can count on me, and I'm pretty sure on you, Novel too. Uh, to be partners in crime in, in this journey. And I hope many of you dream big and, and, and start collaborating to, to find the solution. So here you have me for whatever you need. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. Very spot on. Innovation requires collaborations. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, go for it. So Fanina, thank you so very much for being with us today. Uh, You're welcome. It was a very insightful uh, talk that you, you have given to us. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And see thank you. you our, thank you. So see you in our next webinar. So bye. Thank for you, now. everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye.